Realism is one of the most difficult to define aesthetic modes of cinema. So many different kinds of movies can seem real and in such different ways that it should make us wonder if realism has any stability as a category at all. So let's examine a particular kind of cinematic realism that we can call the aesthetics of the unstaged. The idea of the unstaged goes all the way back to the very first projected films, when early spectators were apparently mesmerized by the wind in the trees of the Lumiere film The Baby's Breakfast. One explanation given for this fascination was that early spectators, whether or not they realized it, were fixated on the leaves blowing in the wind in the background because the leaves were moving on their own, unlike everything else in the scene which had clearly been placed in front of the camera by the filmmakers, the leaves seemed to evoke the autonomy of the world unfolding independently of the filmmaker's control, something that you couldn't just see in a theatrical version of this little scene, or in a painting of it. In other words, the leaves were appealing because they were unstaged. And things that appear unstaged were appealing because film and photography, unlike other art forms like theater or painting, have the unique ability to capture the world unfolding independently of the artist's control. As film theorist Andre Bazan puts it, photography completely satisfies our appetite for illusion by means of a process of mechanical reproduction in which there is no human agency at work. In fiction film, of course, there's tons of human agency at every level of formal design. Cinematography, mise-en-scene, sound design, script, performance, etc. But if it's recorded on film, there's always going to be a sliver of the spontaneous, of the uncontrollable. So here's the paradox. A film as a medium already has an element of the unstaged built right in. How can filmmakers, in the name of realism, create an aesthetics of the unstaged? In other words, how can you stage the unstaged? To find out, let's look at Charles Burnett's 1978 film, Killer of Sheep. The film is a loosely told story about Stan, a father and husband who works in a slaughterhouse in Watts, California. Watts is a working class neighborhood in South Los Angeles and the location of the 1965 Watts riots, a state of civil unrest spawned by police brutality against an African American motorist. Part of the film's commitment to realism, of course, comes from its location shooting in this neighborhood of Watts. Like the Italian neorealist filmmakers of the 1940s who took their cameras to the rubble-laden streets of war-torn Italy, Burnett takes his camera to the streets of Watts, a place that, if not marked by the damage of war, is marked by structural inequality and the very then-recent history of the riots that responded to that inequality. And the comparison with Italian neorealism doesn't end there. A lot like its Italian predecessors, the film does feature non-actors, it restricts itself to location shooting, it uses largely natural light sources, it tells the story of a marginalized group and the circumstances of their struggle. Each one of these often cited characteristics is posed against the artifice of Hollywood filmmaking, the artifice of scripted drama, the artifice of recognizable movie stars, the artifice of elaborate set design. But Killer of Sheep is a lot more with realism than is suggested by this checklist. It also creates the impression of the unstaged, of situations that seem in one way or another to exist independently of creative control, situations that are captured and recorded by the camera. The most immediate element of the unstaged might be the slaughterhouse where Stan works. It's an actual slaughterhouse with actual slaughterhouse workers and actual slaughtered sheep. The footage in the slaughterhouse documents or indexes the material reality within it things that exist in our world as much as they exist in the fictional world of Stan and his family. Another element of the unstaged is the film's focus on children at play. The film is littered with these sequences. We get the impression watching these sequences that even if the children are aware of the camera, and even if they were asked to play in front of the camera, the play itself is largely unscripted. And in fact, as Burnett himself has explained, this is exactly the case. These kids went uh, in their spare time enjoyment would, would jump across the roof, you know? Did it look dangerous or did you it, look at it like just fun? It didn't look dangerous at all because they, they would get back and run and jump over. And for them to fall, that would have been a terrible accident, you know? And I wasn't thinking at the time, I, but, but they were doing it anyway. It was something they did every day. But we don't need to take his word for it, as some moments make that unstaged element impossible to deny. During one of these sequences of play, the camera pans and zooms to find a boy crying from hurting his wrist. The boy's pain seems absolutely genuine, not a performance of pain, but the real thing. While of course we can't prove the reality of the boy's pain, and in fact we can't prove the reality of our own pain in a philosophical sense, everything about the formal design of this moment reinforces the impression of its reality. 
The camera's initial movement toward the boy doesn't introduce him as a character, but seems to respond to something that happens spontaneously. Or take this moment, when the boys are riding on a bicycle and then a dog runs up to them. The moment seems absolutely spontaneous, a seemingly unstaged encounter with a neighborhood dog that by definition has no awareness of the cameras or the fiction being constructed. But as Burnett himself will explain, there is an element of planning involved. You see the dog coming around the corner on the bike. Um, you know, there's two guys on the bike, and uh, the dog was following them, chasing them rather. And they come about here, and the bike goes out of frame. And the dog just keeps on going like that. And, and that was just a lucky uh, accident with the dog? No, we had to do it several times. What of course matters is not the degree to which the encounter with the dog is actually unstaged, but whether the encounter with the dog gives the impression of the unstaged as a signifier of realism. While Killer of Sheep is filled with filmed subjects that are emblematic of the unstaged, namely animals and children, the film's aesthetics of the unstaged is also a function of how those subjects are filmed. We might first notice just how many of these sequences of children playing are shot with a telephoto lens, which we tend to associate with documentary film because such a long lens allows you to capture your subjects from afar without being seen. For example, in this sequence, the telephoto lens allows for the child to completely obscure the children in the distance as she seems to spontaneously enter the frame. This deliberate imperfection is a small detail that enhances our sense that the children are oblivious to the camera. And you'll notice that the very same imperfection occurs at the end of the sequence when the boy fills the entire frame as he runs away. All of these choices, big and small, cinematographic or narrative or sound related, all contribute to an aesthetics of the unstaged. So what are the stakes of this aesthetic approach? There's no one answer, of course, but for Burnett, the appearance of letting the world happen has a political motivation. To the films Hollywood, what was making at the time, and uh, so I wanted to do a film that um, uh, didn't reflect my values, but reflected, in a way, what was going on in the community without me imposing on it. What Killer of Sheep reminds us is that not imposing on the world in front of the camera does not mean stepping back and just letting the world happen. Rather, such an approach to cinematic realism is the result of a series of careful choices that create the impression that no choices have been made at all. <laughs>